Okay, well, once again, good morning, everybody. I'm very excited to be back with you guys. Um, you probably didn't notice, but I was away for a couple weeks. My wife and I uh, took some time off. We were gone for about two weeks, took a little vacation. And, and I don't want to rub your noses in it, but we actually went and spent our time at the very popular tropical getaways of Yorkton and Estevan, Saskatchewan. Yeah, right? Uh, and actually, the funny thing is, Yorkton would be boasting, because we weren't even in Yorkton. We were in a small town outside of Yorkton named Springside, Saskatchewan. And if I asked you if you knew where that was and you put your hand up, I'd probably think you're a liar. Um, no one really knows where that is, but it is where the Breitkreitz clan hails from. Well, actually, for the last 70 years before that, it was Germany. So we went there for a family reunion and then down to Estevan to visit my wife's side of the family, and it was Awesome. Uh, if you're new or visiting this morning, or if you're watching online now or in the future, just a special welcome to you. I just realized I haven't introduced myself yet. My name is Ross Breitkreitz. I'm one of the pastors here at DPC. Now, I'm going to start off the message, but I want to begin by asking you guys a question. Did you, or do you, do you collect anything, or have you collected anything when you were growing up? Yeah? We got some collectors here. Yeah, that's awesome. Now, when I was younger, uh, it seemed like collecting would kind of, there'd be fads of what you were collecting when you were in elementary school, okay? Uh, and actually, the first thing I ever wanted to collect, and my parents didn't really, like, encourage me or get, let me get into it, but the first thing I remember ever wanting to collect was stamps. Because of a movie called Tommy Tricker and the Stamp Travelers. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Does anyone other than Aaron know about this movie? No? Oh my gosh. Yes, I see that hand. Okay, uh, I think it was 1988. This was unbelievable. And this guy, uh, he would like jump into stamps and then travel wherever they went. Unbelievable. So I wanted to collect stamps and be like Tommy Tricker and the stamp travelers. But like I said, my parents didn't let me collect stamps. But in elementary school, there would be like waves of things that would be really popular. And so for me, it went uh, marbles. Did anyone collect marbles? Yeah? Uh, I even made one of those like Plinko boards. You know, your friends could put a marble in and like you set it up so you just rip them off. Yeah, they didn't play much, but I, I had one of those. Uh, and then it was hockey cards. Honestly, unapologetically, if I could justify it, I would still collect them. I love hockey cards. I actually have a couple up here this morning. We'll get to that. Uh, and then I'm really dating myself with this one. Anyone remember Pogs? Yeah? Oh, yeah. I was big into the slammers. Yeah, Pogs. Uh, anyways... The reason I mention all this is because when, when we have collections, when we have things that we value, that we treasure, that, that seem important in our lives, even if it's just for a season, one thing that seems to commonly come along with that is a discussion. Is a discussion that many of us have probably had. And that discussion is who or what is better right? Who or what is better? Now, I call it a discussion, but if we're honest, it's an argument. Uh, and so here's a couple arguments I'd like to start this morning, okay? So, uh, some of us have probably even had these conversations before. So who is better? Is it Muhammad Ali or was it Mike Tyson? Ali. All right. Uh, who's better, Michael Jordan or LeBron James? Jordan. Not even one LeBron James. Uh, who's better, was it Backstreet Boys or Insync? There's only one right answer. It's Backstreet Boys, that's right. Um, uh, what's better, Coke or Pepsi? Also, oh, way more Pepsis than I would like. Uh, it's Coke. Uh, is it Chev or is it Ford? Chev, there we go. And then the last one, which might be one of the biggest conversations or arguments or discussions that people have had over the years. What are you going to have as a house pet? Is it going to be a dog or is it going to be a dog? Because cat <laughs> is never an option. <laughs> cat is not an option. So just argue about which breed you're getting because you're not getting a cat. Not an option. 
So, now that we're all fighting, uh, and some of you hate me, and please do me a favor, don't come up to me and be like, you'd love your cat. It's gonna be awkward, because I'll smile and I'll nod, but I won't. I don't like your cat, trust me, okay? So, now that we've covered all this, let's bring this all back. Why am I talking about this? Well, because this is kind of the conversation that Hebrews is going through. This is kind of the conversation that the author of Hebrews is having with his readers. He is writing to them and talking about who is greater. Now, when you have a conversation like this, what you oftentimes talk about is like, you know, stats, statistics, information, uh, life achievements of the individual that you're arguing is better. So you're like, okay, what was the role that they were supposed to play? Uh, did they fulfill all the requirements of that role? And then you formulate your answer and then you fight. And so the author of Hebrews is explaining that Jesus is greater in this letter. But greater than what? Okay, and so far what he's talked about is that Jesus is greater than the prophets, than angels, than Moses. And now he's talking about how Jesus is greater as a high priest. Now, what we're going to see is that, uh, well, for, first of all, this. For most of us, that's not an issue, is it? Like, that's not an argument we have to have in our head. We don't read Hebrews and think, yeah, prove to me that Jesus is better than the Old Testament people, right? Most of us here, if we're Christians, we already agree with that. But this is what the original readers would have been reading, and we need to understand that this was huge, okay? We need to understand that these people, like, this was their all-star lineup, The people that Hebrews is saying Jesus is greater than, these are like their heroes. These are people in their hall of fame. Because when it came to knowing God, being in relationship with God, approaching God, being in God's presence, for the people who grew up in the Old Testament tradition, there were no one greater than these figures that were mentioned. And now the author of Hebrews says, no, wait, someone else has come along, has entered into the scene, has played the game better than anyone, and his name is Jesus. And so in order to defend and explain his reasoning and his logic, he's going to talk about some of the requirements of this role, specifically the role of great high priest, and then explain why and how Jesus fills that role better than anyone has previously. Now, when I got to thinking about this, and as I was reading and studying uh, the book that we're going to be in, which is, or chapter, which is Hebrews chapter 5, I actually started viewing it almost the way I would have looked at hockey cards, right? And I always have hockey cards. I actually use hockey cards as my Bible bookmark. So if anyone wants a Bible bookmark, I got two up here. I got Sidney Crosby and good old Christian boy Mike Fisher. So you can grab those. But What happens with hockey cards is you look on the back, and on the back they break down the information. So you can see statistics, you can see information about, you know, how good they were when they played junior, or all the places they played prior to coming to the NHL that made them fill the requirements to play that position. And then you get statistics like games played, points, penalty minutes, which was usually my highest one uh, in my stat categories. But this is what you get, and you can look at the two cards and see, and you can compare players at a glance. So, this is what we are going to do this morning. We are going to look. They didn't actually have high priest trading cards, could you imagine? Um, But we're going to pretend that if you looked at the back of one, what are these three categories that Hebrews talks about today in Hebrews chapter 5? that were requirements in order to be a high priest, and how does Jesus come and fill those better? So, they break down like this. A high priest is chosen and appointed from among men to be a representative concerning God. A high priest will deal gently with those going astray and aware of their own need for God. And a high priest is selected by God. 
So we're going to take a look at those three roles. Now, last Sunday, when you guys finished off Hebrews chapter 4, the last two verses actually begin discussing Jesus in this role of high priest. And those paragraphs kind of work as like a transition paragraph in between uh, the topic of rest that Peter preached on and where we're going this morning. So I actually want to go back. We're going to read the very end of 4. Then we're going to move into Hebrews 5, read through verses uh, 1 to 10 is what we'll cover this morning. So, Hebrews 4, verse 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who's been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Every high priest is selected from among men and is appointed to represent them in matters related to God. He's able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray since he himself is subject to weakness. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as for the sins of the people. No one takes this honor upon himself. He must be called by God just as Aaron was. So Christ also did not take upon himself the glory of becoming a high priest, but God said to him, you are my son, today I have become your father. And he says in another place, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. We'll pause there for now. Uh, So, What does all of this mean? Well, we're going to break it down, and we already talked about those three categories. So, what does it mean for a high priest to be chosen and appointed from amongst men? So, looking at requirement number one, high priest, what was needed? Did Jesus do it better? Let's see. So, what does it mean that they needed to be appointed from among men? Well, it simply means this. A high priest needed to be one of us. Because if you think about it, theoretically, God could have chosen anyone or anything to play that role of mediator in the Old Testament between man and God, of representative. He could have chosen some form of angelic being to be his representative, but he didn't. He chose from mankind. He chose from amongst us. He wanted to make sure that we had someone who would sit in that position who could identify with what it truly is like to be human. And most, more specifically, he chose sons. The role and the position of high priest was genealogical in nature. It was hereditary. So that means after Aaron, the first high priest... It would be his oldest son would become high priest, and his oldest son would become high priest, and his oldest son would become high priest. Do you see the pattern? It was hereditary in nature. One pastor in a sermon I listened to said this. He said, uh, in school in the Old Testament on career day, there was never a booth for high priest. There was not a job you could attain. This is what I want us to hear, is that in the Old Testament, to be a person who could stand before God, you needed to be called. You couldn't attain it. You couldn't earn it. You could not achieve it. And that pattern has not changed to this day. To be able to stand before God, we still need a mediator, and one has been provided which means we cannot earn it, we cannot achieve it, we cannot learn our way into it, we can't sacrifice our way into it to be able to come before God. It has to be something that is God-given. And he has sent his one and only son. He did not ask for your firstborn son, or he's not going to ask for mine. He sent his one and only son to be a great high priest and provide the way for us. It has been provided. There is no one more suited. There's no son more suited among men to be our high priest than the son of God. Second, is Jesus a better representative? 
of God to man and man to God? Well, absolutely, because he was not simply and merely a representative. He was God in bodily form. He revealed throughout all of his life the truth and the reality of who God is and how God is. So requirement number one, Jesus does it better. Check mark. Requirement number two, a high priest needs to be able to deal gently with those who are going astray and also aware of their own need for God. Why was this important? Well, I already mentioned it briefly. It is important because God wanted someone who would understand, sympathize, and empathize with us in our lives as we battle and we wrestle with our humanity and our call to holiness. And if you have been a Christian for any length of time, you have probably felt that strain and that balancing act or the the friction and the conflict that can wage inside of us when we have to deal and confront our sin in our lives. Now, here's the thing. We are aware of that, but I want us to realize what it must have looked like or not what it must have, what it looked like for the people in the Old Testament to do that to deal with their sin, because it was very different than how we deal with it today. Today, uh, if, if something happens, what oftentimes will take place is you will confront it when you're at home, you know, in private, during prayer. You will confess to the Lord. Now, do not hear me saying that is wrong. I am not knocking that. It's literally Jesus came to provide the way for us to have access to the Father at any times, anywhere, okay? I am not knocking that. I'm just saying that is very, very different compared to what they were doing in the Old Testament. So I want you to imagine with me this scene. Imagine, and I'll say temple, but picture coming to your church, Picture, you are coming to deal with your sin, and what are you going to do? Well, you are going to get a lamb or a goat, and you are going to walk to your local church. Okay? Could you imagine having to do that? You have to go out to the field, you have to pick the finest of your flock, and then you walk down the block while all of your friends and family see you with the finest goat from your herd. And they're like, huh, where, where are you going with that very fine-looking goat? What did you do this time? It wasn't very private. Could you imagine the wrestling match that might have been going on inside your head at that moment? Like the shame... And, and, I mean, I, I don't own a goat, but I've been around a few. They're stubborn. Could you imagine dragging? Come, come on! Like, oh. And meanwhile, inside, your human heart is going, I don't want to go confess. I don't want to go. I want to go less than this goat wants to go. This is what it would be like, this procession to go and come to the temple. Imagine having to do that, to come to the church. And then what happens is when you get there, your lead pastor is going to come. So you're going to come into the church, and then Peter's going to inspect the goat. Peter's going to check out your goat. And he's going to make sure it's suitable, that it is good, that it's pure and spotless. And then after it gets the green light, what's going to happen is you're going to be instructed to then place your hands on the head of this animal. And before it gets sacrificed, you are then going to declare out loud your sins in the hearing of your pastor. Let's be honest, that would suck. (laughs) That would be really awkward. This is what these people had to do. Like, this scene would have been chaotic because what we can definitely probably identify with is that, that hesitation, that reservation, right? I don't know if you've ever been there. Have you ever just not wanted to speak it out loud because when you speak it out loud, it almost confirms that it actually happened? And you're so filled with guilt and shame and regret that you don't want to hear your own mouth admit what you did. 
And then at the same time, well, you don't want to do that. And well, you, if you finally reach that point where the words start coming out, maybe the tears are rolling down your cheek, this goat is squirming and it's fighting and it's trying to get away from underneath your grip. Well, you stand there in the presence of your pastor and you air your dirty laundry. So why was it so important that a high priest be someone who is gentle and who's sympathetic? Because let me tell you, in that moment, you don't want to be standing next to someone who treats you like he's holier than thou. You don't want their eyes bulging in shock over your stupidity. You want someone who is sympathetic and who is gentle in nature and who they themselves understand the wrestling match that's going on inside. This is why this was so important. This is why this was one of the most primary and important tenets of what would make a good high priest. And now if you know anything about the life of Jesus, how much greater was he at this than anyone else? Jesus was a man who spent years of his life alongside normal people just like you and me. He not only saw, but he knew the struggles and the trials and the temptations that we faced. Yet he was still the man who said, do not throw those stones. Do not throw those stones at that woman unless you yourself are without sin. Now, here's the thing. He was there without sin. Yet he is still the man who in that moment, he turns and he looks to the woman and he says, where are they who condemn you? Is there no one who condemns you? And she says, no one. And he says, neither do I. Go and sin no more. This is the grace and the mercy, the sympathy and the gentleness of our high priest. There is no high priest who filled this role and this position better than Jesus. His entire life, his entire testimony of his life is a story of a gentleness towards people like us who are going astray, who are prone to wander, and yet he calls them back into the fold with tenderness. It is the kindness of the Lord that leads us to repentance. This is who our great high priest is. No high priest has ever walked with people the way that Jesus did. No high priest was more approachable or accessible or sympathetic with what we were going through and are going through. In fact, our final verses in Hebrews 5, well, they go on to further highlight how deeply Jesus is able to sympathize with us, with our emotions, and with what we're going through. And they go on to say this. So we're going to finish. I think these are verses 7 to 10 here. Let's read our final verses in chapter 5 this morning. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered and once made perfect. He became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. And he was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Jesus can sympathize with us deeply. Uh, almost every scholar uh, believes that this verse is specifically referencing Jesus' time of prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane before he was crucified, where he experienced such anguish that he would sweat drops of blood, where he would profess in prayer, Father, your will be done, but would you remove this cup from me? He knows what it is like. He can sympathize with us. And what I love is that not only can he sympathize, even though he was without sin, he still reveals a life that needed to be uh, reliant on being in communion with God. Even though he was without sin, he reveals a life that was dependent and reliant on being in connection with the Heavenly Father. 
The verse talks about how the original priests, the original high priests, they were aware of this. They were aware of their need for God because just like the people, they would have to sacrifice to atone for their own sins. But in contrast, this is something Jesus never would have to do. You know, in verse 2 of Hebrews 5, uh, the wording in my Bible, it's discussing, it's explaining the high priest, and it says that they were subject to weakness. That they too themselves were subject to weakness. That was, that's just my, I use an NIV, that's what my translation said. But I looked up a couple other translations, I don't know what you guys use, but I looked at the ESV, the English Standard, I looked at the King James, and I looked at the North American Standard Bible, the NASB. And this is how they word that verse. Uh, The ESV says that he was beset with weakness. The King James says he was compassed with weakness. And the NASB says that he was clothed in weakness. And I I actually prefer that a little bit stronger wording that they use there. I personally find it more identifiable for me. In fact, in my studying, I found that the original wording in Greek would actually sound even stronger and would have read like this. He himself is completely encircled with moral weakness. I don't know about you, but I have felt that way before. So because of this, they would sacrifice for their own sins. In contrast, this is something Jesus would never have to do as he lived a sinless life. Yet, despite that, he still shows this life of dependence on God and showcase grace and mercy towards us even though he was without sin. You know, numerous times in the gospel, what would he do? He would get away so that he could spend time in prayer conversing with the Father. And all I want to say is this, is if a man who was without sin needed to be that constantly in prayer with the Father, how much more do we need to be spending time in prayer with the Father? Another thing about this is that I believe when you spend time with God, you're going to become more and more acutely aware of your need for him. You're probably going to become more and more acutely aware of his tenderness towards you, even in your weakness, even in your sin, even in your temptation. And as a result, I would hope that is going to make you that much more tender towards others in their sin, in their weakness, and in their temptation. This is what Jesus revealed If you're spending time with God and it's making you less tender and it's making you more bitter and more judgmental, you may be doing something wrong. So as a high priest who is gentle with the wayward and dependent on God, Jesus was greater. Now the third requirement, high priests were selected. You need to be selected by God. You can't just uh, achieve this position. Now we've already discussed how that was done. They were selected. Uh, It was hereditary. You had to be the firstborn son. And Hebrews 5 has also mentioned twice Jesus was appointed by God as the son of God. But it also mentions something else two times. It mentions that his calling and his placing in being high priest is of a better, higher order because he comes in the priestly line of a strange man named Melchizedek. Now, you may remember this name. It's from the Old Testament. Okay? He appears very briefly. He's somewhat of a peculiar character, even for scholars still. So what happens is he shows up during the time of Abraham. So in Genesis 14, this is kind of the scene of what's going down. Abraham, uh, him and his nephew Lot, they had recently split and kind of parted ways. And where Lot was living, what happened is four kings rise up and they go to fight five kings. And the four kings beat the five kings and take off with much plunder and they take Lot in tow. Someone escapes from Lot's crew. He, they, he, she, I'm not sure. They run. They tell Abraham. 
And Abraham musters up 318 fighting men, and he goes in pursuit of these four kings who just beat five kings. And he absolutely beats the wheels off these guys. And then he comes back with all of the plunder. So now he's got nine kings worth of plunder and his nephew Lot. And on his return trip home, he has this encounter with this man named Melchizedek. Now, I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail regarding Melchizedek, and I'll explain in a second, but a couple things I want to point out is that Melchizedek is the very, 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 very first time you see in all of Scripture the title priest assigned to someone. He's the first person assigned the title of priest in the Bible. And another thing that is worth remembering is this. Melchizedek, now normally there were kind of three primary roles in the Old Testament. There was prophet, priest, and king. And you never served in, in any of them at the same time, right? If you were king, you weren't a prophet or a priest, and, you know, around and around the circle you go. Melchizedek is told to be not just a priest, but a king. He holds both roles, and he is known as the king of Salam, which means Jerusalem. So Melchizedek is the first priest and king of Jerusalem is what we learn. And so the reason I'm not diving more into that, though, is because I'd like to use this part of the message as clickbait for you to come back. Because our author is going to circle back to the topic of Melchizedek in chapter 7, where he is going to go in depth. So I need you to come, keep coming back so that you get to chapter 7, and then you discover why uh, it is so much greater that Jesus is a high priest in the order and the line of Melchizedek. But for the time being, I think we already know enough to say third requirement check mark, Jesus does it better. So in summary of Hebrews 5, what do we have? Jesus is a greater high priest. That is what it is saying. <clears throat> now, I already said this at the beginning. I'm going to say it one more time. Here's the thing, though. Is there more in this for us? Because whether we're here this morning or we're watching online this morning or sometime in the future, there's a really, really, really good possibility that you didn't need to hear this sermon so that Hebrews would tip the scales because you were just like, I'm just still really hung up on the Old Testament high priest. And I'm not fully convinced that like Jesus is the way to go. Right? Like, I don't think that was a big concern for a lot of us as we move through the passage. So what I want to do is I wanted to challenge and say, okay, then what is in this passage for us, for today, to walk out of here, to look at these scripture and say, as Christians who are now, like, unapologetically convinced that Jesus is greater, what is in this passage for us? So I want to touch on two things here. And the first one is this. Jesus is greater means Jesus is greater. And I'll explain exactly what this means. Let's go back again for one second to the start of the message when we talked about, you know, the greatest or who is the greatest or what is the greatest. And what we need to remember is that for the, the figures that were being talked about and discussed in this passage... For people who grew up according to the Old Testament, there was no one greater. You need to try the best that you can to understand and contemplate what the passages in Hebrews were actually asking these readers if they fully become convinced and then switch from Old Testament to Jesus. You need to understand what that would come with because it wasn't just a switching in your mind. It wasn't just a logical transition. It wasn't just, oh, I thought something and I went this way. Now I think something and it went this way. It was literally a request to change everything about your entire life and everything you have ever known. And what the author is trying to say is, I do not care what you have to give up, what you have to sacrifice, what you have to forfeit, because Jesus is better. 
Like, he's trying to say, you better make sure that he's worth it because at some point, it would actually come at the cost of forfeiting your family. And the writer of Hebrews was not, this was not lost on him or her or them, yet they are still making the argument that Jesus is better, that whatever you are holding in your hand, if you have to let go of it in order to pick up Jesus, the exchange is worth it. Jesus is better. And that is why this is just as applicable to us today. Of all of the things that you hold dear, of all the things that you cherish, of all the things that you value, of your goals and your dreams, maybe it's your kids, maybe it's your job, maybe it's your bank account, maybe it's your title. If there is something that is getting in the way and you need to let it go, no matter the cost Hebrews wants you to know, it's worth it because Jesus is better. The first thing we can take away from this passage is that simple truth that Jesus is better means Jesus is better. The second thing that I think we can take away from this is that Hebrews 5 means this, that you, me, us, the church, we have a call on our lives. And that call is not just to share that message, that Jesus is greater, that Jesus is better. The call that is now on our lives is this. We are called to be a nation of priests. We are actually now called by the Lord to fulfill some of these same roles and positions that these priests were in the Old Testament. This is what we are being called to. Because 1 Peter 2 tells us that we are a nation of priests. This is what God is doing. That means we are chosen We are selected by God. We are here to be representatives of him. And we need to deal gently with those who are going astray because we are aware of our own need for a savior. This is what we are called to do, to walk with God and to be patient and loving with those who may not yet know him, to have compassion on them and to sympathize with those who are lost and who are going astray because we understand our own weakness, because we understand the struggles with temptation, because we are honest with ourselves that we needed a savior. We need to be advocates for this truth, and here's why. Because I firmly believe, and I would venture to say, some of you either know people right now in your life, or you have met people along your walk, and you know that they would actually genuinely love an encounter with God, but they hesitate coming to him because they don't know what they're going to get when they get there. Because they mistakenly, do not understand the kind of throne that our God sits on. I want you guys, if you have your Bibles, and if this is the first time you open a Bible this morning, I want you to go to Hebrews chapter 4. I want you to look at verse 16. And I want you to tell me. I want to hear it out loud so there's no excuse, so that you all know, so that we don't leave here unaware. What kind of throne does it tell us our God sits on? A throne of grace. Some translations say that he sits on a throne of mercy. And this is what we should want people to understand. This is what we should want them to hear. Because there are people walking around. They would want an encounter with God. But they fearfully and mistakenly will not approach him. Because they think he sits on a throne of disdain, of anger of disgust, just waiting to squish us like little bugs. And we need to be a nation of priests that advocates the truth and lets the world know that couldn't be further from the truth. My king sits on a throne of grace. And I I thought about this this morning as we were worshiping. I just thought it was so funny because back in the Old Testament, because remember, the Old Testament way, it was... 
it was what it was. It served a purpose, but it was not nearly as good as what we have now in Jesus. And I couldn't help but think it's very interesting to me that in the Old Testament, God's presence was seated. It was on a mercy seat. It was a mercy seat, but what's better than a seat is a throne of grace, and that is what we have, and that is what we need to tell the world that they will get when they come to Jesus so that they don't mistakenly believe that he doesn't want them just the way that they are. We need to tell the world so that they understand what actually is going to happen when they come before our Father, when they come to that throne of grace. Because somewhere along the line, they develop this thinking, this wrong thinking. And I'll just go out and say it. Maybe some Christians led them to think that. Maybe the church led them to think that. But we need to tell them the truth of what they will get when they come to our Father. Exactly how you are is exactly how God wants you. This is what we need people to know and understand. I want to tell you guys that that accusations of your unworthiness, accusations of your condemnation, they do not come from the Lord and they should not come from Christians either. Do you want to know why? Because in Revelations 12, it describes Satan as the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night. So what I want to make sure is that if there's anyone here this morning or watching online and you feel accused, condemned, unworthy, how you are is exactly how God wants you. And you need to know this, that at the same time that Satan is doing this, there is someone else in the room with more power and with greater authority. And this is what the Bible tells us. And he isn't an accuser. It's Jesus. 1 John 2 says that he stands before God and he pleads our case. That doesn't sound like a God who's not on your side. Jesus stands in that room and he pleads our case. So when I walk into the courtroom of the king, I can try and defend myself or I can use Jesus as my attorney. It's your choice. We need the world to know how for them our God really is. If you're coming to God, you come right now. There's no more need for the goats to be sacrificed. Jesus, once and for all, laid down his life. So Jesus isn't performing a ministry like the Old Testament anymore. And thank goodness, because my life alone would have exhausted him. Like, could you imagine if he's just like, uh, me again, Father, yes, Ross, I know, I know. Oh, me again, Father. It's not lost on me either that it's only been 30 minutes. Like, that is not how it works. It is once and for all. Your shame is gone. Your condemnation is dead. So let us join in this priestly ministry by representing this truth to the world. Our God is greater and he's full of grace. I'm going to ask the worship team to come back up as we prepare to close out this morning. But as we do, uh, I actually want to also do this. I want to ask you guys to stand. I just want to ask you guys to stand right now as a congregation, if you would, because I want to do something. I want to read that passage of Scripture from 1 Peter over us this morning as a church. I want to read it over us as a nation of priests, and whatever posture you feel you may want to take in order to receive this word, I welcome you to take that right now. Raise your hands, close your eyes, maybe kneel. It doesn't matter, but I want you to hear these words this morning. And then what I want as an outflow of the truth that is gonna, that you're going to feel hopefully from these words, I want you to do what this verse says and just worship our king and make this song an anthem for us. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 to 10. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. God's special possession that you may declare the praise of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. 
Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Amen? You have received mercy. That means no matter what you did last night, no matter what you did this week, no matter what you said to your family on the drive to church this morning, will we come to that throne of grace and receive that mercy this morning? The last thing I want to say before I end the message is this, is that I cannot stand here and talk about our need as a call, as a nation to share this truth with the world, I could not in good conscience put this microphone down, sit down without extending the full invitation of coming to that throne this morning. So I'm going to ask you, if you are in this room this morning, this may seem bold, but as we begin to worship, I'm going to be up here worshiping, and if you want to come and come to that throne of grace and mercy and give your life to Jesus, I would invite you to be bold and walk to the front of the room. I would love to pray with you, but I just want to tell you this. Your heart, your mind, it's going to scream. It's going to lie. It's going to tell you that that's going to be a walk of shame, but I assure you it will not. You are in a room with brothers and sisters. That condemnation is dead of people who will rejoice. It will be a walk of honor as we celebrate a life that is set free by the truth. So I want to invite you to do that this morning. And if you are watching online now or in the future, it's literally as simple as this. I don't care where you are watching from. You just pray. You say, Jesus, I believe you died for my sins. I need you come and change my life. And if you've prayed that, will you reach out to the church? We would love to answer any questions you may have about next steps. But church, we love you. Will you receive his mercy this morning? And as this verse says, let's declare the praise of him who has called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. Yeah, you can clap. Absolutely. Is our God not good?